That's a poem that is really something that's quite topical to what we're about to talk about, inshallah. Bear with me, I wrote this this morning, but um, I hope it sets the tone for the siege, inshallah. It's called Final Siege. Final Siege. This is humanity's last stand for what is right and what is good. Again, this is humanity's last stand for what is right and what is good. For as the Zionists have planned, and with them the shameless have stood, a plan of 75 years. New Rafa, New Rafa awaits in Sinai. But as the patient would stand their fears, preferring in Gaza to die. The corridor will soon open as the basic supplies run out. But warriors put their hope in the aspiration to be devout. Ya Rabb, make them all steadfast. Ya Allah, make them all steadfast. Ya Rabb, make them all steadfast. As the world stands with that bully. The victory will come at last. As you complete your favours fully. On Saturday, October the 7th, 2023, we were all witness to an extraordinary moment in modern history. It was the moment in which the Palestinian resistance completely blindsided the Israelis in a military operation by land, by air, and by sea, which led them to taking back land, albeit temporarily. But they did take back, back that land that was seized from them all the way back in 1948. And the world looked on in shock. Netanyahu humiliated. And before we go on to discuss this in detail, Franz Fanon, who was a political philosopher, and he was also part of the um, Algerian Liberation Front, he said something that's worth noting today. He said, we revolt because we can't breathe. Well, the Palestinians have been suffocating, not for a year, not for five years or ten years or even fifty years. They've been suffocating for a hundred years. Whether it's the British Mandate Palestine and the beginning of the colonial project, whether it be the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948, where in which 750,000 Palestinians were forced off their lands, some of them forced into what is now the Gaza Strip, whether it be the 1967 war leading to the Israeli military occupation of the Gaza Strip as well as the West Bank, or whether it be the 2007 siege on the Gaza Strip by the Israeli government, which is still in place to this very day. The Palestinians have been suffocating, suffocating. And that makes resistance inevitable. 
You see, the Gaza Strip itself is 25 miles long and 5 miles wide. It contains 2.2 million people, half of them children, in the most densely populated place on Earth, which, as you may know, has been described as the biggest open-air prison in the world. And since Israel laid siege to Gaza in 2007, they have assaulted this defenseless population on five separate occasions. Firstly, in 2008 with Operation Cast Lead, then 2012 and 2014 and 2021, and now in 2023. Pulverizing this land, butchering the people, the men, the women, and the children. And it's been a very, I think you can agree with me, a very intense week this week. A very emotional week for us all. I myself am a very stoic individual. I don't really show emotion that much, but today and this week, as I've been reporting on the incidents, I've been breaking down with the things that I've been seeing, which we've all been seeing, with the children being dragged out of the rubble, with families destroyed, with the lands obliterated. It's heartbreaking for all of us to watch. And the pain that we feel when we see these scenes I guess you could say it's matched by the anger when we see the inevitable, it has to be said, but when we see the Western governments that are uncritically supporting the Israeli government as they commit their crimes, as well as, as, well as the mainstream media who aid and abet them as they commit their crimes. But in this situation, the situation that I described, it's ongoing. And the worry for us all is that much worse to come. So to make sense of it all, we are very much honored to have with us today, Sami al -Hanadi. And Sami is the Managing Director of International Interest, which is a political risk firm focusing on the Middle East. And by my measure, he's really one of the foremost political analysts of our community, alhamdulillah. He appears regularly on podcasts, uh, on various media outlets, and he also publishes as well. Sami, jazakumullah khair for joining us today. And I want to begin by talking, I guess, to set the context about this operation, Operation Al-Aqsa Storm. And it was quite striking because Hamas, alongside Jihad al-Islami and all of the other groups that partook in this operation, they managed to do something that people thought was impossible, which was to breach the Iron Dome defense, to break the defensive line across the Gaza Strip. And somehow, as I mentioned, they blindsided the Israeli occupation, which supposedly has a very, one of the most sophisticated surveillance systems, with, has an advanced intelligence service. So, it really shocked the world, it shocked Israel, it shocked everyone that was watching. And the question presents itself, how were they able to do this, number one? And also, why now? Why not a year ago, or two years ago, or five years ago? Jazakallah khair, first of all, thank you to everybody for being here. I confess I went downstairs and I waited, and then they told me everybody's waiting for you upstairs. And I came in and I thought maybe Aisha hasn't been prayed yet. So, barakallahu uh, fikum for coming out today. Um, I think that first and foremost, it's easier to set the context by putting yourself in the position of Netanyahu. And some of the stuff that you might hear today might be a bit hard on the heart, but I think it's the easiest way to understand what's happening. Before I begin to answer the question, I think it's important to highlight that we may be on the cusp of another genocide. We may be on the cusp of an ethnic cleansing. There is optimism in the bigger picture in terms of what all these events mean for the wider issue of Palestine and the hopes for Palestine in the future. But in terms of where it stands now, Israeli army has positioned itself ready for a ground offensive and they're waiting for the political order in Tel Aviv. And the US Secretary of State Blinken is now visiting each of the Arab capitals. He visited Doha today. He's expected to go to Riyadh and then Abu Dhabi. And he's expected to say to each of these rulers, Israel is going to go in, stay out. Israel is going to go in, don't interfere. 
Israel is going to go in. These are the goals it's going to achieve. When it's finished, then I'll invite you to come and talk. There is a report today that Blinken, the Secretary of State, has banned three terms in the, Secre in the Secretary of State Department. In the State Department. He's banned the word ceasefire, he's banned the word de-escalation, and he's banned the word negotiations. None of these words may be used by any US official until Israel completes its strategic objectives, which, is not, which was not the original American position when the incident first broke out. But we'll get into that maybe a bit later, perhaps through the other questions or the like. I think that to understand how they managed to pull it off, I think it's easier to put yourself in the position of Netanyahu. For the first time since he came to power in 2003, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish president, finally sat with you face to face in New York in the United Nations. And Erdogan's message was very clear. I don't want confrontation. I want to build a gas pipeline with you and I want to build a Middle East corridor with you. The Middle East corridor that was announced in the G20 summit in India, which is a plan in which India will send its goods across the sea to the UAE and then go to Saudi Arabia and then Jordan and then Israel and then to Europe. Turkey's Erdogan said to Netanyahu, why? We make more sense to be in the corridor and our developing of ties and relations can facilitate that and I'm ready to set aside our antagonism in exchange for the development of these economic initiatives. Netanyahu was so happy that the so-called style, the self-styled Sultan of the Muslim world was sitting down with him openly in New York calling for a truce and calling for this new economic development between Turkey and Israel. At the same time, Netanyahu has visited Saudi Arabia twice and met with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And according to a Reuters exclusive, bin Salman has told the Israelis and the Americans that he's willing to set aside his demands for a Palestinian state in exchange for three things. The first is a NATO-style agreement in which the Americans promise to protect Saudi Arabia from Iran. For those of you who think it sounds ridiculous, Iran's proxies in Iraq have fired missiles at the Royal Palace in Saudi Arabia. Iran's proxies in Yemen have fired missiles at oil facilities in Saudi Arabia and over Jeddah when Saudi was hosting Formula One. And Iran to the East mainland has instigated from time to time protests and rebellions in the east of Saudi Arabia. When the Houthis hit the oil facility in 2019, the Saudis were convinced that the Americans would come rushing in and they would punish Iran. Instead, the Americans turned around and said, Wallahi, they don't say Wallahi, but they said, we want to negotiate with the Iranians. We want to talk to the Iranians. We're not going to escalate. And this is what led to the Saudis reaching out to China or the like to threaten the US to say, we are punishing you. We're going to go to China if you don't protect us. Bin Salman has said, I will set aside the Palestinian cause in exchange for a NATO-style security agreement where you protect me and you go to war with any country that sends a missile against me. The second condition, if you give me nuclear technology to develop, to develop nuclear facilities and a potential nuclear weapon. And number three, that you promise to bring your American companies to invest in my Vision 2030, which is supposed to look not like Shanghai, not like Moscow, it's supposed to look like Miami. I want to build something that looks like Miami in Saudi, I need you to help. Biden agreed, according to the Reuters exclusive, Biden replied and said, I can't get this through Congress. Congress won't allow me to give you a NATO-style security agreement. But what I can do is to order something like the Fifth Fleet, so there's a huge fleet that protects Bahrain. I can order a fleet whose sole order is to protect Saudi Arabia, and I don't need Congress for that. According to Axios, which is close to the Israeli government, the Israelis have agreed to start giving the Saudis the nuclear technology in order to start developing the nuclear proliferation. And that's why the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the custodian of the two holy mosques, told Fox News, we're getting closer and closer every day to normalization of ties. And it's also the reason why when the Saudi ambassador went to Palestine and he wanted to pray in Al-Aqsa as a gift to the Israelis to say, I can talk to Israelis and still pray in Al-Aqsa, the Palestinians stood in front of Al-Aqsa and refused to allow the Saudi ambassador to pray. And the Saudi fearing being publicly humiliated in the way that the Bahraini and the UAE ambassadors were when they normalized ties and tried to go to Al-Aqsa, the Saudi ambassador said, I'm a bit pressed for time. I'll pray next time I come, inshallah, in Al-Aqsa. <laughs> Netanyahu has received all these indications from the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Then there is the UAE's Mohammed bin Zayed, the UAE president who no matter how much Netanyahu raids the Jenin refugee camp 
in a bid to push the refugees out so that he can get the settlers in. In Huwara, where they're trying to push the, settler, the, the Palestinians out to get the settlers in, no matter how much of the flare-up, the UAE always produces a statement in favor of the Israelis. And two months ago, the UAE ambassador to the US told the think tank conference, he said that normalization of ties has failed to produce gains for the Palestinians. But isn't it amazing how many flights we have today between Abu Dhabi and Tel Aviv? Normalization is no longer going to bring benefits for the, Israel, for the Palestinians as in our normalization and it's up to future countries now that normalize to get the gains for the Palestinians. But can I tell you how much trade has boomed between us and the Israelis? So Netanyahu now has Erdogan, Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Zayed who are no longer <coughs> reacting to anything that you're doing to the Palestinians. Which is why when Netanyahu went to the United Nations, and I know it sounds like a long-winded response, but the context will make you appreciate why this is so unprecedented and why Netanyahu is desperate to smash the Palestinians, not because he wants to eradicate the Palestinians themselves, but eradicate the hope and spirit that is roaring today that everybody last week thought was dying. Netanyahu went to the UN on this basis and he waved a map in front of the UN. On that map, when you see it, there is no mention of Palestine. There's only Israel and it covers all of the territory of Palestine. In the same breath that he showed this map and celebrated it, he said normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia will be the greatest deal since the end of the Cold War. And the U Israeli ambassador to the UN with Can Television, the Israeli channel, was asked by Can Television, Netanyahu has given a bombastic speech, but will his right-wing government agree to normalization of ties with Saudi Arabia. And the Israeli ambassador replied, normalization of ties means the Arab abandonment of Palestinians. And when the government understand this, they will know exactly what decision to make. So when Netanyahu returned to Tel Aviv, Netanyahu believed that the Palestinian cause was dying, that the Muslim states would no longer support the Palestinians, that the Palestinians no longer had any support. They had nowhere to go, that they're at their weakest point, that Netanyahu was now talking about the potential that within his generation and his premiership, he might actually be able to finally annex more Palestinian territories without any reaction from the Muslim states. In other words, Netanyahu was convinced that Palestinians have no agency because the Muslim states are not supporting them. And this is why when the Egyptians allegedly told the Israelis that there's something coming, something is brewing in Gaza, something might come. This is one of the reasons why I argue Netanyahu ignored the warning. On this particular point, it is worth noting that it's unclear if the Egyptians said, I know there's a lot of people on social media, Sisi, you traitor, treachery or the like, but I'm not defending Sisi, but I think there are two distinct scenarios that are worth appreciating. The first is, did Sisi say to the Israelis, that there's an attack coming from Gaza next week and they're prepared and they have everything ready? Or did he say what everybody else is saying in the open, which is that Netanyahu, the more you ignore the Palestinians and normalize over their heads, the more likely you're going to have this time bomb that's eventually going to explode, which is something King Abdullah of Jordan said two weeks ago, which is what Erdogan has been saying for the past year, which is what even some of the Bloomberg journalists and New York Times journalists have been saying. Any Tom, Dick and Harry could have told Netanyahu that if, you, eyes. that if you ignore the Palestinians, that eventually they're going to explode and they're going to whatever. So it's unclear what it is the Egyptians said to Netanyahu with regards to this. But regardless, to put this all into context, so you've sat with Erdogan, you've sat with bin Salman, you're talking with bin Zayed and, and ties are thriving. You've gone to Biden, Biden says, all clear, go with the normalization of ties. The Palestinians are, not, are divided between themselves and they can't even come to an agreement between themselves. If you're Netanyahu, do you honestly believe that the Palestinians are about to mount the most potent attack since 1948? Of course, you would never believe it. And that's why it took the Israelis by shock. It took the Israelis by shock, not necessarily that the Palestinians were attacking. Netanyahu believed that even if the Palestinians attack, what's the worst they could do? They might penetrate the Iron Dome, one or two rockets might land in Tel Aviv, but we can always then pummel Gaza and they'll go back. Netanyahu did not envisage that for the first time since 1948, the Palestinians would actually retake land back from the Israelis. Well, Netanyahu did not envisage 
that for the first time since 1948, the Palestinians would be able to hold those territories for more than 72 hours. Netanyahu did not anticipate that even if he retaliated and bombarded Gaza, the rockets that were fired from Palestine into Israel, 72 hours passed since the attack and Ben Gurion airport was still shut down. They could not reopen the airport. There was even a picture of a former president trying to run away. He was in Ben Gurion airport trying to flee. Planes couldn't land in Ben Gurion airport, which was such a humiliation for Netanyahu that 86% of Israelis in today's poll are demanding his resignation and blaming him for bringing the greatest calamity to Israel, not since 1973, since 1948. So the point here being, and to answer the question before I hand over back, if you're Netanyahu, is there any way you could have seen this coming? If you are Palestinian, is there any way you could have seen this coming? Last week, the Muslim world had turned its back on you. Today, suddenly, the Muslim world is roaring in its support for you because you pulled off on your own without the support of the Muslim uh, regimes that were supposed to support you, on your own, with your own agency, without Bayraktas, without Saudi weapons, without UAE weapons, you pulled off the greatest threat to Israel's security since 1948. It was not supposed to happen. And that's why the bombardment of Gaza that's taking place today is not a bombardment against Gaza itself, as much as it's a bombardment of the spirit that is suddenly raging and roaring and suddenly revived. And I'll put this into context, and I promise I'll hand over back to for, for the next question, but I won't go on for this for too long. My maternal side, I come from an Algerian background. My father was a Mujahid who fought in the mountains against the French, and until his dying breath, he could not stand the French. One of my uncles went to France and bought back the tea bags, and my grandfather said, oh, this tea bags, I love tea. Oh, it's France, and he threw it out the window. The point is, the French did horrible things, and one of the things they did was, in 1945, and you'll see the comparisons here with what's happening today, which is why I started with the tragedy and why I say that in the bigger picture, there's actually room for hope. In, in 1945, imagine France has been liberated from Nazi Germany. France, which was toppled in two weeks by Nazi Germany, was finally liberated in 1945. The European powers got together, the Western powers, they wrote a wonderful UN Charter. They wrote, every man is born free. Every state has, every people have the right to self-determination. Every man is equal. Every man is deserving of justice. The Algerians thought, Allahu Akbar, this is such a lovely document. We want independence and this dignity as well. So in Stif, in Galma, and these areas, in the eastern areas of Algeria, they decided to get together and to protest. So thousands took to the streets to say, Congratulations on your freedom, we want ours now. When they started protesting and the French started clamping down and they used some militias as well that came from Senegal who were known for brutality to really crush the protesters, the Algerians reacted as well with violence. The French, according to French records, the French had a meeting in Paris in which they said, look, there are two ways we can handle this. We can push the protesters back into their homes and negotiate with them, but then we'll open the door for more protests elsewhere, people will see France is weak. The second option is the option they went with, which is, let us batter them so badly, let us make rivers of blood, let us slaughter them in their thousands, so that they know the price they will have to pay if they even think about challenging our authority in, in France or in Algeria. Let us smash them, their women and their children. Let us kill them indiscriminately so that when they start to think about protesting against us again, they will think twice before they ever take to the streets against us again. According to French estimates, so that's the conservative, the ones where they don't tell you the truth, 12,000 died in a week. According to Algerian nationalists who perhaps exaggerate, 50,000 were killed. Let's go for a middle number between the two exaggerations. 30,000 Algerians were slaughtered in a week. Doesn't compare to any of the numbers you're reading about. When the French were finished, they were convinced that now that we have smashed not just the Algerians, but the spirit, they will never rise up against us again. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, 17 years later, the French were out. 
17 years later, the French were kicked out. The Algerians, every historian who writes about Algeria, they declare 1945, the massacre in Steve, as the turning point. It was the turning point when those who are pursuing rights within France turned around and said, this is not possible anymore after today. So a tragedy is unfolding before us, and I hand over now for, the, for the next question. The tragedy unfolding before us is ethnic cleansing and genocide. The Israelis have turned off electricity so that the phone batteries of the Palestinians can die, because if you note, the Israelis are telling us what is happening, but the Palestinians are showing us what is happening. That's a quote by Asim Quraysh, I'll give credit where credit's due. I loved it, I saw it on Twitter, and I use it everywhere I go now. The Israelis are telling us what is happening, the Palestinians are showing us what is happening. So before Israel wants to go in and commit its genocide and ethnic cleansing, it wants to make sure nobody in the world sees it. Mm. And tomorrow, because somehow the Palestinian phone batteries are not dying as quickly as they thought it was, the communications minister of the occupying forces of Israel have announced that tomorrow they will shut off internet from Gaza. They will shut off internet to make sure you cannot see or hear what is about to unfold in Gaza. But I want to finish on this point before handing over. I know I've repeated it many times and I'm notorious for it, but please bear with me, I promise you. It's because I'm trying to make the point clear. The reason that the Israelis are doing it, what hurts Netanyahu more than anything else, the reason the Israelis are doing it, is because they are so horrified and stunned that the world is saying that a ragtag, they're not ragtag, but the world is saying that a ragtag group of Palestinians inflicted the greatest defeat since 1948. It would have been better for Netanyahu, he would have found it better if there was Turkish support or Saudi support. Then he could say that the Palestinians are weak, but they're being supported internationally. Netanyahu is furious that people are saying, no, it's the Palestinians who have their own agency and their own power, and they're able to fight for themselves and impose for themselves instead. And Bloomberg's front page two days ago said that the Palestinians have resoundingly proven that it's a myth that you can normalize ties with Israel and ignore the Palestinian question. That in itself is one of the greatest defeats for Israel and for Biden's administration in their pursuit for normalization of ties. The reality is that Netanyahu is lashing out, not because he feels like he's strong, but because he believes that these victories are so difficult to overturn, and he's smashed the Palestinians, and he's caused rivers of blood, and still he can't wipe away the humiliation that the Palestinians have inflicted, a humiliation that will have strong ramifications or sweeping ramifications for the terms of the de-escalation when they sit down and talk about the concessions that are made. And to put that into context, in 1973, the humiliation of the Israeli, of Israelis losing Sinai and losing territory around Syria and the like, led to them conceding territory to Egypt. In 2010, 2011, the Palestinians captured a soldier called Jilad Shalit. Jilad Shalit, when he was caught, it was such a humiliation because Israelis are not used to being captured and they're not used to fighting on a level playing field. The Israelis were so horrified by it that the Israelis conceded 1,500 Palestinian prisoners in exchange for the one Israeli soldier. 1,500, not soldiers, 1,500 Palestinians who had been arbitrarily detained illegally by the Israelis, brutally by the Israelis. That was considered the concession that the Israelis made because for Netanyahu, even after the ground offensive, he was still humiliated. They said, Netanyahu, you've done your ground offensive and you still haven't been able to defeat the Palestinians. So Netanyahu said, I'll cut my losses, I'll make a concession, take it, and it was considered a humiliation for Netanyahu. And that's why I, I, I know that many Muslims are pitying the Palestinians for what's happening, but I think that underplays the extraordinary bravery and the victories that they secured, which I think will be a turning point moving forward for the Palestine-Israel issue. I'll, I'll see the ground for the, for, for the next question, but inshallah. You touched upon it there, but I think we need to actually discuss this in further detail because we did receive news today that the Israeli government ordered the people of northern, uh, northern Gaza to actually evacuate the area into the southern regions and gave them a 24-hour deadline. Uh, the speculation, of course, is it's a prelude to a grand invasion. Uh, others, uh, of course, all of us are fearful that this could lead to a potential ethnic cleansing, a second Nakba, if you will. Um, the question that I want to put to you is this. 
how do you see this playing out in relation to Netanyahu and his position? Because, and I'll add this as context, the last time there was a ground invasion into Gaza, the Israelis got stunned. It's a very difficult incursion, and Netanyahu, as you mentioned, has already suffered a severe humiliation, and he recognizes the danger of entering in. So, and I might add to that as well, in previous assaults of the Gaza Strip, the American government has always given Israel a window of opportunity to inflict as much destruction as possible until it becomes politically unfeasible to continue, so they rein them in eventually. This is very different. This is very different because of the fact of the preemptive attack and because of the fact that the Palestinians were able to penetrate into the Israeli territory. So the question really is, how do you see this playing out? And what do you see as a satisfactory conclusion for Netanyahu and the Israelis? Is it as their stated aim is to destroy Hamas, which I don't see how they will be able to do so? And of course, as it always is the case, it's their desire to restore their deterrence capacity to strike the fear into the Palestinians such that they might think about doing something like this again. So how does this play out going forth? I think that when it comes to the ground offensive, I think that let's take a look at the calculations that Netanyahu is making. So Netanyahu believed that within 48 hours he would be able to drive back the Palestinian offensive. And he didn't. When the Israeli interior minister announced in the first 48 hours that they had retaken the settlements, the mayor of one of the settlements came out on video and said, stop lying, there's still clashes going on here. When within 72 hours, the government said that finally we've managed to restore order on the Gaza border, Ben Gurion Airport was suddenly announced to be shut down because the planes couldn't land because the rockets were going in. The, what that shows is that Netanyahu has desperately been trying to give off the image that everything is under control. But the reality of the situation has always been able to dispel the myth that it's under control and that he doesn't have it under control. And that's why there was a viral video with, amongst the Israeli social media of these two individuals who lost family members who are shouting and saying, Netanyahu, we hold you responsible for what happened. Resign and leave now. Netanyahu had hoped that one of the avenues that he could escape from it is by forming a coalition government, a war government. What the war government would allow him to do was to present himself as a war hero and it would also end the calls for his resignation. The problem for Netanyahu was Yair Lapid and Naftali Bennett and these other uh, officials, they smelt that Netanyahu's political position was, was weakening. So instead of joining his government, they called for his resignation as well. And then when that didn't gain traction, they decided to call for terms and concessions from Netanyahu that Netanyahu wasn't willing to give. Even Benny Gantz, the right wing who is supposed to be aligned with Netanyahu, didn't enter Netanyahu's government until more than 72 hours into what was happening. Suggesting that Netanyahu crumbled and gave concessions to try to form a government. And even with those concessions, he couldn't form a war government. The reason why I mention it is because it shows that the Israelis between themselves are not agreed as to what is the best way to handle this unprecedented Palestinian offensive. The other reason that there has been a delay in the ground offensive is not because the Israelis are building up and getting ready for it, but because the Israelis are concerned about a number of factors that they're unsure will come into play or not. Will Hezbollah cross the border in Lebanon? Will they start firing rockets? Hezbollah, for example, for the record. The reason, and I've seen it a lot in the comments of all interviews that I seem to do, Sami, you tend to be cold when you talk about the Iranians. That's because Iran's support for Palestine does not negate the demographic changes it did in Syria, where it would put Sunnis on buses and kick them out of their land and replace them with Shia populations in order to drive this change in the demographic and the sectarian changes in these countries. Iran's support for Palestine does not change the fact that the Houthis, who believe that only somebody who is descended from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is allowed to rule and that it is a wajib to fight war after war after war in Yemen because only somebody from the Hashimiyin is allowed to rule and the Houthis are in their seventh war in Yemen to try to re-establish re this system in Yemen. 
The point here being is that this, all this does not negate Iranians, which is why I hesitate to overplay the Iranian role in terms of their support for Palestine. I would much prefer that the Iranians ease up on what they're doing in the other countries than they go headlong in hoping to gain credit from the Palestinian cause. But regardless, going back to the politics, the Israelis are not sure if Hezbollah will cross the border. Hezbollah in the first few days, those of you on social media kept seeing rockets fired from Lebanon, rockets fired from Iraq, and then the news would come out, oh, it was only in a couple of areas. Hezbollah's message to Israel is clear. I don't want to enter into an all-out war with you. I don't want to fight you. I'm not ready to fight you either. But if you go too far with Hamas, I will have no choice but to enter. Otherwise, my reputation will be blown to pieces. So the Israelis responded, and the Israelis are trying to discuss where is the line in which we should not cross. If you notice in the American statements, their emphasis is always on we don't want this conflict to expand into other areas. We don't want it to go to Lebanon. We don't want it to go to Syria. We don't want Iranians getting involved. We don't want to provoke the Muslim nations in getting involved. Although I do think the Americans are really relaxed about the stances of the Muslim nations and the like. But the point here being is the Israelis in this fog of war are not sure. And that's why there's been a delay in the ground invasion. The second reason there's been a delay in the ground invasion is the issue of the narrative. And this is where every single one of you should celebrate the role you played in breaking Israel's monopoly in the narrative. When Israel, for the past 70 years, has told the world that Palestinians are barbaric animals, they are barbarians, they are not educated, and that they are a violent terrorist group who don't deserve and they keep killing us because we are Jewish and the like, they kept feeding a lot of these false fallacies to the world. In 2021, Israel, for the first time, lost its monopoly on the narrative. A new Palestinian generation emerged, and this is not to discredit the previous generation, a new Palestinian generation emerged, which is eloquent in English, which is tech savvy, and emerged at a time in which we have social media, which is the primary source of information for everyone. The decentralization of information. Which meant that when the Israelis were saying that the Palestinians are coming after us, the Palestinian videos of what the Israelis were doing in Palestine were going viral. There were people who sympathized with Israel, who saw those videos and said, I never knew this is what Israelis do to Palestinians. That's why Benny Gantz, the, in, the defense minister of Israel in 2021, he summoned the directors of TikTok, Facebook and Instagram and had a meeting with them and said to them, I want you to take down all the Palestinian content. The reason he won't take down all the Palestinian content, the reason the interior minister takes time out in an emergency situation to sit with these social media directors and tell them to take down Palestinian context, uh, content is because all of your shares, retweets, comments, and promotion of the content meant the algorithm kept feeding it on the social media feeds which means that those who were never used to the issue before didn't know about it was suddenly being exposed to the other side of the story and la ilaha illallah they found the other side of the story very convincing the reason why i mention it in the context of this grand invasion we talk about the media and you mentioned the media being biased but i think it's a bit more gray and more complex than that when the media invited Hussein Zumlot or Mustafa Barghouthi or, or Muhammad al kurd and all, I assume everybody has seen how the Palestinian ambassador shut down the media presenter when she was like, do you condemn yourself? That video didn't go viral just among Muslim communities, it went viral globally. The Israelis were used to seeing Palestinians smashed on the media by virtue of their inability to convey in English or by virtue of their reliance on a translator to convey what they had to say. But if I ask you, was Hussein Zumlat not eloquent, masha'Allah? Was Mustafa Barghouthi with Farid Zakaria not eloquent, masha'Allah? Was Muhammad Al-Kurd on LBC not eloquent, masha'Allah? So what ended up happening was the Israelis were convinced that the media would be able to promote a pro-Israel narrative, and suddenly they found that more and more people were sympathizing with the Palestinians. Not only that, Elon Musk has changed the algorithm on Twitter, which means that the more likes and retweets a tweet gets, the more it gets shown, and now you no longer only see the people you follow, you see tweets that are popular as well on your feed as well. So suddenly all of you Muslims who are liking and sharing and retweeting, random individuals on the other side of the world were for the first time seeing tweets they would never have seen before. That's why the European Union has issued a warning to Elon Musk telling him to reimpose restrictions and he replied with that John Stewart video where John Stewart says, I, and Israel today, and everybody says, ah, 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 Israel is an anti semite And he goes, like, Ya Ilahi, what happened? He doesn't say Ya Ilahi, but he says, oh my God, what happened? And then he tries to say Israel again, ah, no, no, and they shout at him. Elon Musk replied to say, I'm not putting these restrictions back. That's why sometimes Muslims, they always talk about in the bleak picture, and what can I do? Wallahi, 
you are part of this battle and you've delivered emphatically. You delivered so emphatically that Netanyahu had to make up a lie about 40 beheaded babies. <laughs> Netanyahu had to make a lie about rape. He had to make a lie that the Palestinians had harassed the Israelis. Now imagine, in the first few hours, Al Jazeera published a video of a Jewish woman surrounded by Palestinian fighters. And the Jewish woman is panicking, holding her baby. And the Palestinian fighters are shouting, Usturuha, Usturuha, cover her, cover her, protect her and reassure her. Let us show her a humanity that doesn't exist with the apartheid regime. Yeah, Sami, we've all retweeted it. I saw, I saw, and then initially I saw it on a feed by a Saudi activist called Omar ibn Abdulaziz. And he put in Arabic, Ya Alam, Tarjimuha wa Shuruha. Translate it and, and, and so quickly I took the tweet and I went, Tarjimuha, there's not enough space. I only have about 45, 40,000 followers on Twitter. I've never had a tweet within two hours reach one million. On Omar ibn Abdulaziz, it got to eight million. On another account, it was 20 million. On another account, it was 40 million. That video went viral. Imagine the neutral who's been told the Palestinians are animals. Imagine how they suddenly feel when they see that. They suddenly think, hang on a second, something here is not normal, something is not processing properly. But I'm not convinced. Then that Israeli settler on Channel 12, everybody's seen it. They came into my house. <laughs> and they, uh, and I, was, I was worried, I was scared. She's sitting relaxed, very calm, chilling. And he says to me, don't worry, I'm Muslim, so I won't hurt you. <laughs> and her face, her reaction is this, her face is this. <coughs> I felt relieved, and I was suddenly calm. And the presenter, the presenter says, but what did they do? What did they do? What did they do? They walked around for two hours. <laughs> one of them, something from the kitchen. One of them said to me, saw the bananas and said, "Excuse me, can I have one?" <laughs> and I said, "Of course, go ahead." And he ate the banana. He smiled at my kids, and they left. Put yourself in Netanyahu's war room. Let's do this political. Join me with the political risk analysis. Be part of my industry for for, for a few minutes. Put yourself in Netanyahu's war room. Your multi-billion dollar PR enterprise is trying to tell the world that these people are animals. But the most viral videos are showing that these Palestinians are human. We're in a panic. We need a lie. Send the I-24 reporter. Send her to one of the settlements and say that there are 40 babies who have been beheaded. Now here's where tragedy strikes. Not only does the lady claim, and then later she says, I didn't actually see it. But mainstream media, and here is where I blame them, they were so desperate to believe that barbaric Muslims, they were so desperate not to believe that Muslims could be human. They were so desperate for something to say, no, they're not human, they're not human, they're barbaric. That they dropped all journalistic standards and they began to share it. And this is where I think there was a setback in the PR narrative. But Netanyahu, when he was convinced that he had finally succeeded in changing the perspective, again, I'm not exaggerating here. I'm not trying to make you guys feel good about yourselves. I'm telling you what it is. Because of the algorithm on X, and because I assume every single person here lambasted the accusations, you're lying, you're this, where's the proof, and whatever, and that kind of thing. The I-24 presenter issued a clarification that she didn't see it. Then the independent journalist said, I didn't see it, it was an IDF source. Then the CNN reporter said, I didn't see it. Then suddenly, everybody was retweeting those. So suddenly, all the news outlets that had reported it are trying to backtrack now. No, no, it's not confirmed, it's not confirmed. And then CNN, which for 24 hours ran with the story, four hours ago, before we, we meet over here, the CNN presenter comes out, I apologize sincerely for promoting this story that has turned out to be false. This is what I mean. Abu Sufyan said, Al Huruf, Al Harb Karru Far. It's some days, for me, some days. But this war of narrative is a war that you're fighting. The reason they had to backtrack was not because they suddenly had a change of heart. They knew that it wasn't confirmed. They knew that the story could be false. The only reason that they backtracked was because you forced them to by the overwhelming public pressure that forced them to do so. Going back to the question why that links is because Netanyahu could not do a ground invasion when the world thinks the Palestinians are human. 
He has to do a ground invasion when the world thinks the Palestinians are barbarians. So when the 40 beheaded babies was debunked, they had another accusation which is that they killed a woman and she was naked and they paraded her on the back of a jeep. Then Newsweek reported that the girl, the lady is actually alive and she was being taken to hospital to be treated for injuries because she got caught in the crossfire. Another deadly blow to Israel's PR machine. So Netanyahu could not launch a ground invasion. And this is why Netanyahu proceeded to cut the electricity. Because Netanyahu's policy now is, I, the lies aren't working, let's just cut off their communication to the rest of the world. And the media have said, if you see Noura Irekat, somebody, she's very uh, eloquent on the media, Noura Irekat has reported that her media, she was being invited to media for the first 48 hours. Now the Palestinians are being cancelled from the media. They're being cancelled because they were too effective, too eloquent. They were changing the narrative too much. It doesn't mean the media was with the Israelis. It means the media are concerned that, hang on, we've always been convinced the Israelis are in the right, but these guys might actually have a point. And until I'm comfortable whether I want to promote that point, let's cancel their participation, participation in the media. So the tactic now, because they couldn't dehumanize the Palestinians, it's let's cut off the communication altogether. Let's get the EU to impose limits on social media. Let's cut off the electricity so their phone batteries die. Let's tomorrow cut off their internet so they can't show the world the barbarity of what we're doing to the Palestinians. Let's cut off the internet so that when we say that they kill babies and we can't prove it, at least the Palestinians can't show the real images of the babies that have actually been killed by the Israelis. Let's prevent that from happening. What's happening now is a suffocation. And this is why I go to the point, and I finish on this point. This is why I go to the point about the victory over the narrative. If it didn't matter, Netanyahu wouldn't go to this length in order to push this story. If it didn't matter, if your opinion didn't matter, Bin Salman would not have gone back to calling Israel a quwat al-ihtilal. He would not have gone back to calling it an occupation. You'll remember Bin Salman in a previous statement dropped the word colonization and referred to them as quwat Israeliya. He referred them by their name, but put between quotation marks so that some of the brothers who don't want to see any bad in Saudi Arabia could say, no, he didn't call them Israel. He put it between quotation marks. All of that matters, and that's why I think the ground invasion has been delayed. It wasn't delayed because there's a master strategy. It's been delayed because Netanyahu and the Israelis are not sure how to proceed. They're uncomfortable about proceeding because they're in an unprecedented situation where they don't control the narrative, where the world is starting to sympathize with the Palestinians, and that's why the Americans, especially Blinken, are hardcore pulling out all the stops in order to try to prevent the world from sympathizing with the Palestinians because they're desperate to show this as a self-defense, as opposed to what it is, which is ethnic cleansing and a genocide. I hope some of that was clear. I want to turn to the, the Palestinian resistance in the time we have left, because I think it's really important to discuss this. Before they undertook this operation, an upset flood, they knew full well that, that what they were about to embark on was going to lead to a massive reaction from the Israeli government. That was clearly obvious to them. They knew that they were going to bring destruction upon the Gaza Strip by the actions that they were going to take. Now, that means that there would have been some kind of political calculation in taking this action in the first place. They must have had in their minds a set of objectives, and they must have had in their mind what they envisaged victory would look like from what they were about to embark upon, right? So the question I really want to put to you, and this is an interesting and important one, is what have they gained, or what are they likely to gain from this undertaking that happened a week ago when the dust settles in, say, six months' time? What will have significantly changed for the Palestinian people that perhaps the resistance fighters were envisaging when they went about this action? I think that when the Algerians decided to launch their liberation of Algeria, they were hoping that Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, who was president at the time and the leader of this, this, this Arab ideology, Arab revolution, he'd taken the Suez Canal, he'd liberated it from the British. They hoped that the Egyptians would come rushing in to help them and support them. And they were bitterly disappointed by two things. The first is Abdel Nasser said to them, start first, and if you make enough of an impact, I'll help you. And even when they made an impact, 
Abdel Nasser was concerned because he had other fronts to focus on as well. So it took a long time to start even pro providing the weapons with like. And actually one of the biggest shipments, the first shipments, was caught by the French before it arrived. And the Algerians described themselves as bitterly disappointed at the lack of real support from the Muslim nations that had been liberated. Even Tunisia, the neighboring, it's true that they hosted or they provided an escape route for a lot of the Algerians, but the Algerians had expected more from Bourguiba. But Bourguiba was worried that if he was seen to be supporting the Palestinians or the Algerians directly, the French would come in and reinvade and recolonize Tunisia. And Tunisia had just been liberated at that time before Algeria. I think Tunisia got its independence in 56. The reason why I mention that is that it's important to put the Palestinian approach into context. The Palestinians are not operating from a position of strength, even if they have demonstrated strength. The Palestinians are operating from the world's largest open air prison. Their backs are to the wall. They are persecuted, oppressed. More land is being taken. They have no international support. And this is why I think a lot of this is lashing out by the Palestinians. The reason why I say that is because it may well be that it was a more of a lashing out than a desire to achieve any political aim. I think that the Palestinians had hoped that if they managed to penetrate far enough into Israel proper, then the Muslim world would mobilize and they would say, okay, they're actually about to produce something, let's go in and help. And they've been bitterly disappointed by that. If you've seen Erdogan's initial statement, it was unprecedented. By unprecedented, what I mean is, we're used to hearing Erdogan call Israel a terrorist state and to call Netanyahu Hitler. This time he didn't even blame the Palestinians. And he just said, listen, we're ready to use Turkish diplomacy to get a, to, to, to a de-escalation. Because I really don't want to offend Netanyahu at this time. I've got economic crisis and I'm struggling in Syria. It's, uh, it, it's not the time. Palestinians, you've done this at the wrong time. I'm not ready to support you for it. The Saudis were on the cusp of normalization of ties. The raves that I'm hosting, Iggy Azalea, the twerking in Riyadh, and that's my focus. I'm, I'm organizing these parties. You've done it at the wrong time. I, I, I'm focusing on the parties and the raves. They, I'm about to normalize ties with Israel and Vision 2030. I'm about to get it kicked off in the year that I've lost so much money in the treasury and in the year where my diversification projects are still not producing fruit. I'm about to normalize ties and the Americans are about to give me money. Palestinians, this really isn't the time for you to be going back to try to take over your land. Especially when I've already sent out the invitations to the other OnlyFans superstars who are coming to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I know some of you are laughing, but he's actually sent the invitations. I'm not joking. He's actually sent the invitations out. Even after the uproar, after the first performance, the performer tweeted afterwards and said that I've re it must have been a success because I've just received another invitation from Saudi Arabia. She, she put it on her own Twitter. So I'm not, you can search it, it's all publicly available information. Bin Salman says I need to focus on this, to liberate the Saudi youth from Wahhabism and from the extreme Salafist thought. I need to expose them to what the world looks like so that we can progress and become an economic power. And for the brothers who don't want to believe what's happening in Saudi, they are justifying it and saying that even though we may not like these things, he's going to make a strong Muslim power. Islam is made strong by the raves. Tabarakallah. By the power endowments by the goddess. The Palestinians believed that the other Muslim nations would start to rush in. They'd pressure Israel. Morocco might reverse normalization of ties. Morocco might think, you know what? I'm going to reverse normalization. Just like Morocco reversed ties with Israel in 2000, when the Second Intifada took place, when Moroccans felt it was too politically contentious, the Moroccans shut down the Israeli office in Morocco because they didn't want to be seen on the wrong side. Morocco didn't normalize ties. Turkey allowed protest, and then 48 hours later, when Erdogan really felt the pressure, Erdogan came out and said, what's this barbaric behavior that you're performing? And Erdogan is giving statements now, but being very careful to leave a way back in case he needs to backtrack. Bin Salman has a three-pronged strategy. The statement calls Israel an occupying power. Saudi commentators are saying this shows that there can't be normalization with that Palestinian state. And Saudi bots are attacking the Palestinians and saying this is the Palestinians' fault and they brought it on themselves. So Bin Salman can say, if the Palestinians win, I was with you and look at my statement, I call them an occupying power. If the Palestinians lose, yeah, Netanyahu. Look, I mobilized my, my, my bots on the internet. Look how they lambasted all the Muslims who kept supporting the Palestinians. The UAE is struggling. The UAE initially said nothing. And then in the first, within the first 48 hours, and it's been a blur, I haven't been sleeping well in, in the past 
seven days or, or since it started because of lots of the work or the like, so my timings might be off, so don't hold me too, too tightly to it. But I think within the first 48 hours, Abdullah bin Zayed, the UAE foreign minister, he tweeted that he had a phone call with Blinken. Two hours after that phone call, the UAE issued a statement condemning the Palestinians and condemning Hamas for this escalation and urging that the Palestinians stand down. There was a social media uproar against the UAE. So Bin Zayed decided, I'm, I'm going to be the first one to announce $20 million in aid for the Palestinians, and I'm going to allow the UAE commentators to run wild in their support for Palestine. Anybody who's been, to, actually, if you've been to the UAE, you've probably gone in your capacity as a tourist. Those who go to the UAE as journalists or the like are well aware that in the UAE, you don't say anything that the UAE does not allow you to say. Speech is strictly restricted in the UAE. You go there for your beaches and maybe the nice massage, but you don't talk about politics in the UAE. But this time, there's a commentator called Abdul Khalak Abdullah, very well worth following. Even if I disagree with a lot of what he says, I do think he is still an intellectual, mashallah. Abdul Khalak Abdullah always tells the UAE line, he's run wild. Israel is a barbaric fascist state. Israel is... And all of us are looking and thinking, is Abdul Khalak Abdullah going to be safe? Is he going to be safe? Yeah, yeah Jamal, like, look after him. He's, he's, too, he's saying this stuff in the UAE. But the reason he's saying it in the UAE is because Bin Zayed is saying, if the Palestinians win, I let the UAE run wild in their support for Palestinians. And if the Palestinians lose, I gave a statement criticizing the Palestinians. So alhamdulillah, I'm sorted. I, I, I don't know if he says alhamdulillah. No, stuff Allah. Stuff Allah. Stuff, I take that back. I take it back. I take it back. He says, alhamdulillah, I've got both angles covered. The reason all this links back to the question is, it's because I think that the Palestinians didn't have a political strategy in so much as they wanted to remind everybody that they're there. And that they had nothing to lose and therefore, let's just go for it. Everybody is normalizing over our heads. King Abdullah is saying that they're flying over our heads to normalize ties. Let's remind everybody that we're here. And if that was the aim, they've succeeded emphatically. It's important to stress, and I'll finish on this point. The reason Netanyahu wants a grand invasion, why he wants to go into Gaza, is because if he de-escalates now, the conclusion of every single journalist will be that the Palestinians have destroyed the Israeli narrative that the Arab states can normalize at the expense of Palestine. In the US today, they are saying that the Palestinians have proven that we cannot ignore them and we have to end this process that we're of normalization where we don't engage the Palestinians. That in itself is a major victory. And the last point I'll make, and I, I keep saying last point, but on, <laughs> the last point I will make is this. When Blinken spoke to the Turkish foreign minister in the first 48 hours, usually foreign ministers on their tweets, they, they produce a summary of their phone call. We discuss the need for restraint and the need for, it's always cold language. Blinken's Twitter, he tweeted, or his team tweeted, I assume there's a team that runs it, we discussed with the Turkish Foreign Minister the need for restraint and the ceasefire, and an immediate ceasefire. Within one hour, that tweet came down. And it was reposted and ceasefire was gone from the tweet. Which suggests that in the American room, think about it, someone in the American room posted ceasefire, posted the truth, and somebody came in and said, no, no, I don't want the policy of ceasefire, remove it. Which suggests there's no consensus. Which suggests that there is division and which suggests there is concern and lack of clear strategy about how to proceed on this. The reason why I mention this is think about it, and I, I, this is the final sentence. The Palestinians, in what they've done over the past four days, is they've made Saudi scramble to produce three different PR fronts, they've made Turkey scramble to produce two different PR fronts, they've made UAE go back and forth, do we condemn Palestine or the Israelis, They've made the Americans fall over themselves in terms of what statement and what should be our position. They've made the Europeans fall over themselves. You'll have seen that Oliver Valley of the European Commission said we're going to stop all aid to Palestine. And then Joseph Borrell, the High Commissioner, said no, we're not stopping all aid to Palestine. And then Spain came out and said we're not going to, we're not going to allow aid to be stopped to Palestine. And then von der Leyen put the Israeli flag on the European Parliament and went to Tel Aviv without EU permission. Which shows that the EU are falling all over themselves as well. That's not because a major power made them do it. That's because the Palestinians who we pitied last week have shown that they're a mighty force and Allah has said that I will give them the power even if you choose not to. I'm just going to give a follow-up question before opening up, if that's okay. Just a quick follow-up on what you were saying there. In relation to Erdogan, 
specifically. He gained, over the last 20 years, a lot of currency with the Muslims around the world because of his overtly Islamic character, because of the revival that we've seen in Turkey in relation to Islamic culture and the things that he's achieved, no one can take away from him. But as you mentioned, we've seen a very neutral stance from him thus far, and it has hardened very slightly in the last couple of days. My question in relation to this, and given the gravity of the situation, given the fact, and you mentioned it yourself, that we could be on the verge of a genocide, of an ethnic cleansing, and we know that the hard days are coming forth. Do you feel that now is not the time for pragmatism? I know he's considering the balancing act between his relations with America, the trade routes, the trade corridors that are developing, and this sets to destroy all of that. But, and maybe this is naive of me, but there is a time for pragmatism, and there is a time when we are literally staring at a potential genocide. And if Erdogan does not take a tough stance, it could irrevocably destroy the reputation that he has built with Muslims around the world. So is this now the time to actually take a principled stance and do away with the pragmatism that blights international politics? I urge you all to show me some understanding in what I'm about to say. It might not be pleasing to the ear, but I hope you will understand what I say. My political education came directly from my father. I consider him one of the political geniuses of our modern Ummah. My father, when I was younger, 15, 16, he told me, Sammy, read the Quran as a political book. Try it. Go through the surahs again and read it as a political book. And I found that the Prophet Lut has an ayah, I can't remember the ayah, because I get it confused with another area where Lut complains that he doesn't have the strength to resist the bullying of his people when they try to barge in on his guests. I see that Nuh alayhi salam for 900 years can't convince his people and they deride him and they mock him. He doesn't have the strength to impose. Them, to impose. He even goes to the lengths of trying to promise them benefits. He tried to, you know, not bribe them is the wrong word, but tell them there are benefits to it. Yunus السلام, said, forget these people, there's no hope for them, and he left. And Allah punished him by making him swallowed with the whale. Hud went to his people and they oppressed him. And Allah ended up destroying his people. Salah went to his people and they oppressed him. And Allah ended up destroying his people. Salah and Hud and these prophets, Allah did not give, give them the strength to impose the change in the way he gave to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Do we criticize then the tactics of these prophets because they didn't have the strength to do so? The reason why I say that is because there is a modern example in which when the Ottoman Empire was on its last legs in the 19, 1914, 1918 in the First World War, Remember, the Italians and the French had colonized a lot of North Africa. And in Libya, the French and the Italians had colonized. There was a Mujahideen movement called the Sanusi Order that was fighting the colonizers, who had an allegiance to the Khalifa, to the Sultan. Now, the Khalifa at that time was a puppet of the Young Turks, of the secularists. They had toppled Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and he was a puppet of the Young Turks. And the Young Turks were fiercely nationalist, and they were ready, they saw everybody who's non-Turk as expendable in their fight to push back against the ones who were coming to take over Turkey. One of the things that they did was, they ordered the Sanusi order, knowing full well that they were fighting the Italians and the French at the same time, with very limited capabilities, they ordered the Sanusi order to go and attack the British in Egypt. The Sanusi order got together, and they all looked at each other and they said, Ya Jama'at al Khair, let's be honest and blunt with each other. You can read the narration in Muhammad Asad's book, Road to Mecca. Once we go and attack Egypt, we will be annihilated. We do not have the strength by any stretch of the imagination to fight France, Italy, and the British. The only reason we have a lifeline so far is because the British are jealous of the French and the Italians, and they're happy to see us be a thorn in their side, so they turn a blind eye to the weapons that are coming to us. Brothers, once we attack Egypt, we will no longer have the supplies that allow us to resist the Italians and the French. Should we obey the Sultan or not? 
Half of them said we should obey the Sultan and we'll go to Jannah and we'll be annihilated and eradicated. And the Libyan movement for independence would be set back 40 years. And the other group said, no, we shouldn't obey the Sultan. We have pragmatic, practical reasons. If we are annihilated, the French and the Italians will do to the Libyans what we would never do to our enemies. They decided to attack the British because they felt that the loyalty to the cause, to the Ummah, trumped the immediate concerns and interests that they had, which were also Islamic and noble. They were decimated. Weapons stopped coming. The French and the British started coming into Libya. They took more and more and more and more. And there was a hopelessness for the next 20, 25 years when they hoped that Ataturk would come and help them because they had sacrificed for the Turks. They had sacrificed for the Ummah. They believed the Ummah would pay it back. Ataturk told them, this is Turkey. Ma'as-salama, bye. Exiled the Arab scholars who had gone to rally the Turks to his support. And they went back despondent, wondering, was it worth going to attack the British on the orders of the Sultan, given the Sultan treated us like an expendable force, and now we're under heavy pressure. And those who've seen the film of Omar Mukhtar, you've seen the brutality of what unfolded. Which was the correct decision, to obey the Sultan who's ordering you, or to preserve your movement in which you're fighting against the Italians and the French? It's not an easy decision to make for those of you who believe in loyalty to the Ummah. For me, it's an easy decision. They should have disobeyed the Sultan. The reason why I say this is if Allah Himself in the Quran is talking about prophets who did not have the strength, and Allah said to the prophets, to Lut, Lut, you don't have the strength. Leave your city, leave your village. As Subhu Qareeb, I'm going to demolish your people. And do not look back. Do not look at what I'm about to do to your people. Allah destroyed him with his own hand, not through the hands of Lut. And Lut left, despairing at the fate of his people. Saleh left his people, Allah destroyed them. Nuh, in the flood, is shouting to his son, Son, come and join this. And he's going, no, I'll go to the mountain. يعصمني من الماء. It will keep me safe. And Nuh is in such distress, he says to Allah, Allah, you promised to rescue my family. Nuh is in a position of weakness in our modern sense. In the way that he can't impose himself on his people. He's not the one who imposes the punishment and he can't even save his son. And Allah tells him, don't ask me about your son, Laysa min ahlik. He's not from from. The point here being is this. If those prophets were limited in their ability, it's not a bid'ah to say that Erdogan is limited in his ability. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and I know this is painful on the ear, I know it's painful on the heart. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, Suhail ibn Amr, tried to humiliate him because the Prophet is far from being humiliated. They wrote Muhammad Rasulullah and Sayyidina Muhammad said, Ya Muhammad, if we thought you were Rasulullah, ma qawamnaak, we would not have resisted you. Erase this, this Rasulullah. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I'm not erasing it. No way. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, Ali, erase it. Ya Rasulullah, wa erase it. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam erased it. Muhammad, write Muhammad bin Abdullah. When they signed the treaty, Abu Jandal comes running. Ya Rasulullah, take me with you, take me with you. Abu Jandal had been locked up in Mecca because his father didn't want him to go to Medina. There were reports that he had even been in chains. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, take me with you. The Prophet Muhammad responded to him, Ya Abu Jandal, sabr, sabr, be patient. I've just signed a deal, I can't take you back. If I was a political commentator at that time, I don't know how I would have reacted. Would I have gone to Twitter and said, Ya yeah, Muhammad, stop, stop. But I won't say the sentence. But you can imagine how, they, how can you leave Abu Jandal behind. And some would argue it's a legitimate criticism. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vindicated the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Umar ibn Khattab expressed the outrage so that nobody thinks, Sami, how dare you talk of the Prophet like this. Umar ibn Khattab expressed the outrage. Alas na'ala al haq are we not on the truth? Why are we assigning this humiliating agreement and leaving Abu Jandal behind? In the same way that me and you are saying, these shameless rulers, in particular Erdogan, you're not doing anything. The reason why I put it from this perspective is, everyone is a genius on the bench. I played football all my life, and I played semi-professional for a short while. When you're on the bench, it's easy to say, Wallah, he should have passed here. Wallah, he's an idiot, he should have crossed it on that side. <laughs> so stupid, how could you not bury that? 
But when you're playing and you have the, the midfield is bearing down on you, it's not easy to see the, the pass or to see the shot. I can't give a cricket comparison because I cannot understand why cricket is called a sport. <laughs> but, the point, but the point here being is, the point here being is everyone's a genius on the bench. So when you look at Erdogan, I think, I, I think, and this is where I think that Muslims sometimes, we should be wary about the impact of our criticism in that Erdogan is the product of a Turkish Muslim movement that was tortured, executed, that had to read Quran in secret, that had to mobilize in secret, that had to re-educate the population, that when they delivered Adnan Menderes to power and Adnan Menderes restored the Adhan to Arabic, he was executed by the military. They didn't go home, these ulama and Muslims, they kept striving. When they were arrested for hijab, they kept striving, they kept pushing, and Allah gave them Nasr in that today when you go to Istanbul, it's a haven for Muslims, is it not? The reason why I hesitate in the black and white criticism is, I can appreciate that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, for 13 years is being blockaded, harassed, and his Sahaba are being beaten up. Allah does not give him that victory for 13 years. Even the victory the Prophet وسلم, achieves in the end, he only conquers Mecca and Medina. He only conquers Mecca and Medina, which at that point is still considered by Persia and Rome as a backwater state. But he went down in history as the greatest. Why? Because the fruits of his striving and that's why I think that going back and bringing it back to Erdogan, many people, people will think you're going soft on Erdogan. It's not that going soft on Erdogan. It's that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to do what He wants, when He wants, in the way that He wants. That's what Surah Hud is demonstrating. That's why the Prophet says, Shayyibatni Huda. Because what Allah is saying to Muhammad in that, in that surah is, Inna lan tahdi man ahbabt. You will not be the one who guides them. I choose the one who is guided. If you don't succeed, I will destroy the people. I'm the one who decides ultimately in the end. And that's why subhanallah, subhanallah, Allah rewards the striving. The point that I'm making here is this. I think it's legitimate. And this is where I sound really dark. And, may, and I hope that you forgive me. And may Allah forgive me. I think that it's understandable for Erdogan to say I'm too weak to do anything. I think it's understandable for Erdogan to say, I'm struggling, I've got this far, not by myself, but because of the Muslim movement that from 1920s provided an environment in which I could come to power and begin to try to manifest some sort of Muslim might. So I, I, I accept that. Should he do more? Perhaps yes. But I'm the guy on the bench. I'm not the guy on the, on the playing field on the pitch. I'm not the guy watching the Americans try to set up an independent Kurdish state in Syria so that it can be a thorn in my side in the way Armenia is between Iran and between Azerbaijan and between Turkey. So Erdogan's situation is humiliating in that he could do more. But I would urge Muslims to always, and, and part of my job's political risk consultant is to put myself in, in the position. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself chose his battles, chose the wars that he fought, and if you think even the Battle of Khandaq, the war that he didn't choose, if a political commentator was there at the time, they'd be like, the Muslims are hiding in trench, in trenches. It was Allah who rescued them. Allah rescued them with a storm. It wasn't that they went out and they drove them back. Allah rescued them with a storm. When the Prophet Muhammad was digging the trench and saying, I see the pearls of Persia. The Munafiqin, they laughed at him. They said, well, Allah, all, all, the, all the Arabs have gathered against him and he's talking to us about the pearls of Persia. And Allah gave him victory. So they strived in their capacity that by all objective measures meant they could not resist the opponent and Allah rescued them from them. The reason why I mention all of this, even though it sounds like Sammy wears your ear and I've done this. What I mean is that it's true Erdogan should do more. But I also think that given that Erdogan is the product of the jihad of Muslims in Turkey itself, we should also appreciate the circumstances of what's happening. If Erdogan was to go in with the Bayraktars or the like, what everybody is concerned about now, and it's not some, it's just, I'm just throwing it out there. What everybody is worried about is not that Gaza will be ethnically cleansed or that there will be genocide, even though that's a horrible fate. What they're worried about is World War III. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but what they're worried about is Hezbollah will cross from Lebanon. So the Americans will start hitting Lebanon. And then the Syrians will get involved. 
When the Syrians get involved, the Iraqi militias will cross over into Syria. And then Iraq will be plunged into war between the military, U.S. military bases and between the militias. That's going to spill over into Saudi. The Saudis are going to have to force to choose a side. The Iranians are going to get the Houthis to start firing at Saudi to force them into a position. And then the Emiratis are going to allow U.S. military bases for planes to take off in order to help to bombard their Muslim brothers. And then the Pakistanis are suddenly in a very awkward catch-22. Do we get involved? Do we not get involved? The fires of war are spreading in Egypt. Egypt, the Rafah border crossing. The Gazans are coming in inside. The Egypt army has to do something. It decides to mobilize. When it mobilizes, the Americans want to hit them from Libya, so they go from behind. And they want to hit them from Sudan, so they go from behind. Suddenly the war expands and it becomes uncontrollable. The question that all the politicians are asking themselves is, do we want a wider war, or do we all stay out and watch and hope that this de-escalates quickly? And the reason why I say that, and I finish on this point, is there is no easy answer. There is no black and white answer. There is no easy answer to this politics at all. There is no easy answer to what happens. And everybody's operating based on a set of information that they have, that somebody else might not have. It's a fog of war. Everybody's operating based on that. And we are as well. We're saying Erdogan should get involved, but we don't know if Erdogan even has the capacity to get involved. Bayraktas are all well and good, but the Americans shot down a Turkish drone in Syria. We don't know if the Americans, who have far more sophisticated weaponry, they might be able to humiliate all the Bayraktar drones and will say, Wallahi, suddenly now Turkey was our haven and we've compromised the whole haven of Turkey because we were so desperate for Erdogan to show a macho gung-ho. It is heartbreaking to say this. It is heartbreaking. And that's why I want to finish on this particular point, which is that the reason that we're talking about this in the first place and the possibilities is because when everybody thought the Ummah was powerless, the Palestinians showed that we have power. Erdogan and nagorno karabakh with the Azeris, when they finally liberated the territory that the Americans didn't want to give back for 30 years, we showed Muslim power there. When Muhadr Muhammad and Erdogan and Imran Khan wanted to meet in the Kuala Lumpur summit, Bin Salman panicked so much at the display of Muslim power that he felt could translate into something that he decided to call Imran Khan and Joko Widodo of Indonesia and say to them, Wallah al -Azim, if you go to Kuala Lumpur, I will send all the expats that live here, I will kick them out of the country and I will draw all the financial investment. Imran Khan turned around and said, if he does that, will the Pakistanis still have my back? If I asked you that question, do you think they would? You don't know. I'm not saying that they would or not. You don't know. Will the Pakistanis have his back in the event that Imran Khan took a stance in favor of the Ummah? Would they have had his back or not? Even now they can't even get him out of prison. He's been in prison solely because the establishment believe he's most likely to win the next elections. He's been put in prison. All those thousands of Pakistanis can't get him out of prison. So it shows, even in Malaysia for example, Mahavir and Muhammad Najib, they were all from the same party, and Anwar Ibrahim. They splintered into four parties, and now Anwar Ibrahim is compromising on the Malaysian identity because he needs the Chinese support. He's making comprom compromises that Mahathir Muhammad would never have made. And that's why I think that the reality of politics is this. And even when you read it in the Quran, Allah shows you. Allah gives victory to some. And Allah decided to settle the score with others. Allah gives the victory. And that's why I think that the focus is less on what Erdogan should do. Erdogan is making his own conclusions. May Allah guide him. And may Allah guide the Muslim rulers. But what I want to focus on more than anything else, because it sounds like I'm defending the rulers, but I'm not. I'm saying that it's, just, it's, it's not an easy industry. Everybody likes to talk as if it's easy, but it's not. But what I want to focus on is this. Bin Salman called Israel a colonizer again, not because of the Americans and the Israelis, but because of you, the public opinion. Erdogan is now loud against Israel, not because of the Americans or the Israelis, because of you, public opinion. The reason Imran Khan hasn't been tried and hasn't been put in prison, why it took so long to arrest him, was because of public opinion, because of you. The reason why they had to make up the lie about 40 babies being beheaded is because you debunked it, not the Jenners. The reason why everybody is scrambling and fighting the media or online and social media and the EU wants restrictions on X is because you're winning the narrative war. So when we talk about the bleak picture, I do honestly argue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everybody a certain set of powers. And I honestly think that what's unprecedented about this, and I promise I finish on this point, what's unprecedented about what's happening in Palestine today is the manifestation of the power of public opinion is unprecedented. I've never seen the media fall over itself like this. I've never seen politicians fall over themselves like so Palestine. I've never seen so many Muslims be brave enough to shout about Palestine in this country before. I've never seen it before. 
I've never seen Muslims be so brazen in attacking the narrative as well. I've never seen that the Palestinian videos take priority in the algorithms. Some of you will be thinking, Wallah, he's celebrating cheap victories. You might think it's cheap, but the billion dollar Israeli PR industry doesn't think it's cheap. Benny Gantz met with the directors to tell them to ban the content because he doesn't think it's cheap. Blinken removed the word ceasefire and, and, and de-escalation from the State Department terminology because he doesn't think it's weak. And that's why I think, and I finish up, Wallah, this, this is the point. And this is why I think sometimes, sometimes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِنْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ Allahumma do not take us out of this deen after you have guided us and bestow upon us your mercy. Many of us think that we are Muslims because we became Muslims. Because I have some right, some innate right to be Muslim. We forget it's a privilege. We forget that Muhammad sallallahu himself said, Ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh you who flips the hearts, keep my heart firm in what, and this is, the wahyun yuha, the one who went to the seven heavens, on what, he saw the seven heavens and he made this dua. The reason why I mention that is, it changes the perspective in terms of how you appreciate what Allah has given you. Allah has given everybody a certain set of powers. And I'm not quoting the movie Taken, I'm talking seriously. <laughs> Allah has given everybody a set of powers and different degrees of powers. And he judges you based on how you use those powers. No Muslim is weak. When the Prophet Muhammad went to Heraclius, uh, sorry, when Abu Sufyan went to Heraclius, and Heraclius said to him, who are the people who follow the Prophet Muhammad? Is it your nobility? He said, no, it's the weakest of society. Allah elevated Islam through Bilal ibn Rabah, who was once a slave. Through Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was once a shepherd. Through all of these various different Sahaba, who we would look at today sitting amongst us, and think, oh Allah, what change is this brother going to bring? Yeah, well, I'm miskeen, what does he have? Well, look how he's dressed. Allah has given you example after example after example in the Quran and the Sunnah that the Ummah always has power. The question is whether you have the wisdom and you know how to deploy that power. And that's why I think that really honestly, I know that we're facing a genocide and an ethnic cleansing. But there was a message that came out of Gaza which said that when they turn off the lights on us, don't stop talking about us. Raise our voice outside. Yeah, Ummah, speak on our behalf. Don't let them forget us because the reason they're turning the lights out, the reason they're turning off the internet is because our voices hurt them. Our voices pressured them. Our voices made them trip over themselves. Our voices made them buckle. Don't think that your word is cheap, Ya Ummah. Speak on our behalf because I can see the fear in Netanyahu's eyes. He's bombarding me not because he thinks he's stronger than me. He's bombarding me because he believes that his political future, he's about to go down as the worst Israeli Prime Minister in history. He's bombarding me because when he told the Israelis that I was done for, I've shown the world that I'm here, I'm alive, my cause is alive, and nobody can ignore my cause. Ya Ibad Allah, keep talking, keep raising the voice. You are producing a victory even if you don't appreciate that victory. And that's why I think, subhanAllah, Allah is the one who gives the victory. We are the ones who strive. Allah decides victory and defeat. We are the ones who perform the battle. Allah is the one who will decide the course. Allah will decide how it pans out. Allah will decide how it ends up. Allah is the one who knows the unknown. Allah is the one who knows how everything is going to be at the end of the day, but we don't know. So we strive, hoping Allah will guide us to that which produces the best settlement. And that's why I think that when it comes to what we can do and appreciating the powers that we have, Ya Ibad Allah, never think you're weak because Allah blessed you with this deen. And when He blessed you with this deen, it's an amana. He didn't bless you with the deen so you could stay quiet. He blessed you with the deen to say, Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, that man ra'a minkum munkaran, he who sees something that is wrong, فَلْيُغَيِّرُهُ بِيَدِهِ Let him change it with his hand. And if he can't with his hand, acknowledging that there may be points you are weak, if you can't with your hand, then with your tongue condemn it. And if you can't with your tongue, then condemn it in your heart, for that's the weakest of faith. Brothers, we're in the second category, we're not in the weakest of faith. We're in the second category, which means we are elevated in strength, in our ability to talk about these issues, 
and spread the message and spread the word. And that's why I think that what I fear the most for this ummah is not that the Israelis or the Americans or like will defeat us, for they can never defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the ummah. The Algerians, 30,000 were killed in Stiff. 17 years later, the French were out. What I fear the most is you take the deen for granted. What I fear the most is you forget it's a privilege from Allah and you forget the responsibilities that come with that privilege. And those responsibilities are that you always remember Allah is supreme. You always remember that it's always in his hands. You never despair because Allah says, no one despairs in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, وَإِن تُعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا Count the blessings you have and suddenly you'll see the path starts to clear in front of you. I know what I should do. I know I should open social media and share. I know I should talk about this. I know I should arrange meetings in the mosque. I know I should take a picture of this and put it online so that people know the Muslims care. I know that I should message my brothers, the Palestinian brothers, to say that it matters to me even though I am Pakistani or Bengali or Malay or Indonesian or Latin American. Somebody rebuked me once and they said, you always mention South Asian countries. We in Colombia are crying over Palestine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed so many favors on you at the wisdom. You might not appreciate what Allah gave you and so you're not usually to the maximum striving or the like. But brothers, we're travelers in this dunya. We're here to see, to try to adjust things to make them light and pass on to Jannah inshallah. And Allah will deal with this world. I am a firm believer. My relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of optimism. Allah, I may, I may not understand your wisdom. I know that those who died are in Jannah. There was a lovely photo I saw today in social media. It's a father sitting in Palestine. And the ghost of his daughter, she says, Father, don't be sad, I'm happy. Father, don't be sad, I'm happy with what Allah has given me. You'll catch up with me soon, inshallah. It's a beautiful picture because it shows the mercy of Allah. We are pitying the people who brought a huge victory since 1948. Don't pity them. They don't want your pity. Celebrate the victory. Allah has shown the world that no normalization can erase the Palestinian cause. When everybody thought it was finished, it's roaring. How many of you feel it in your hearts? When you got the news that it happened, how many of you felt the euphoria? Allah Akbar. How many of you felt it? Why did you feel it? Because the despair vanished. You said this Ummah is alive. And it's alive because of you, because you care. That's why I think, brothers, in politics, the most powerful force is public opinion. Those who deliver the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to glory were those who we look at today and think, what can he possibly do for the cause? Allah elevated them. They are Mubashireen bil Jannah. They stood with him and it's because of their efforts. People who today, astaghfirullah, they will call them uneducated. It's because of their efforts that Islam spread to the four corners of the earth. When Lindsey Graham says it's a religious war, what he means is, how is it that we colonize these people and they still believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's why I think, and to finish on this point, that's why I think that may Allah forgive any brother who says, I don't have the power. May Allah forgive the brother who says that we are weak. May Allah forgive the brother who says that we have no power. And may he remind that, to that brother that power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to give victory to the Palestinians. We ask Allah to make us vehicles to help them to deliver victory. We ask Allah to allow us to use the abilities He's given us to promote their cause and to protect their cause. Amen. Brothers, think positively of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think positively of what Allah has given you. And I promise you, today you can only retweet, tomorrow you will have an army to eat. Today you can only retweet, tomorrow you're the foreign minister negotiating the deals. Today you can only retweet, that tomorrow you're the one with a massive charity organization educating people on the deen that inspires the next generation. In the Algerian War for Liberation, Abdul Hamid bin Badi set up what's called the, the, the Council for Muslim Scholars. It was ostensibly an apolitical organization. What he did was he set up a center in every single village in Algeria, teaching them about the history of Muslims and the history of Islam because the French were driving out Arabic and Islamic studies from the schools. The French write in their history books that that movement revived the revolutionary spirit that led to the liberation of Algeria. Brothers, in this ecosystem of Islam, we all have our place. 
Allah puts us in this place based on our talents. And the question that everyone should ask themselves here is, we made the Israelis buckle, we made Blinken buckle, we made Bin Salman buckle, we made Erwallah, we made Erdogan buckle, we made Bin Zayed buckle, we made the Muslim rulers buckle, we made Rishi Sunak him buckle, we made the European Union buckle, we made them all buckle. Brothers, don't be in a position where the enemies think you're strong, but you have this defeatist mentality. We are doing well for Palestine so far. Within the limited capacity that we have, we are deploying it. And I promise you, wallah, they believe that we've scored victories. And the reason they're bombarding us is because they believe they are desperately trying to erase those victories. Because even if the Palestinians are bombarded, the reality is that everybody after this conflict is going to say that Netanyahu lied, he was wrong, normalization doesn't work, we have to have a new method and we have to talk to the Palestinians. Where the Palestinians last week, we said they were dying, today their cause is war, and alhamdulillah, for up Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. May Allah preserve you, Sami. May Allah protect you for this ummah, and may Allah increase you. And then now, we have still some time left. I would like to open up the floor for questions, because I'm sure there are many that would like to ask a few questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, before I do, I'm just going to mention three points before I open up the floor. The first one is, as you've probably seen already, human aid are collecting for the people in Gaza. And there are people collecting, that they're out there at the door, and I'm sure they will, you will meet them on your way out after the questions, inshallah. So please give generously. It's one of the few things that we are able to do, so we should do it if we are able to do so. That's the first thing. The second thing is this initiative is part of the Friday Circle that takes place every Friday in this masjid at 7.30. And next week, Baba Ahmed's going to be delivering a talk in relation to the three characteristics of a real man. And finally, if you would like to follow the updates of the Gaza conflict and other information and news about the Muslim world in an easy to digest form, there is a Telegram group that I run, it's called The Muslim World, so you can just search it on Telegram, The Muslim World. And with that, I open up to questions if anyone would like to ask. Oh, that's all. Okay, lots of questions. Uh, I'm going to start here. The one fellow that curses to us. Yeah, uh, Salam, brother. Um, you, s uh, you said uh, you uh, time ago. Um, you said that uh, you grew up in Algeria as an Algerian resident. Um, here, there's a lot of uh, kind of let's say, uh, uh, like an ignoring of like let's say British Muslim kind of identity, and they say they need some world or maybe it's control. Um, here, we, all we heard is like Hamas, Hamas, Hamas for the last four years. Never the state of Palestine would cause or uh, their their aims and objectives. So it's, it's always this uh, extreme narrative that's presented to us in these days. Um, so they're always completing the two. Uh, Palestinians and you know the Hamas uh, situation. The last, as they said, the also in public. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I was going to say is that here there was a there was a lot of uh, pro EU kind of um, uh, uh, but, um, like a, a pro EU part of agenda up here for a long time, and a lot of Muslims were confused during that time here, um, or what to do. And like the EU was presented as a friend of the Muslims, and this kind of things were out. I was kind of voicing all the Brexit, seeing it as peace separate from Darul Ma'ar would be easier that for us in the long run. Um, but a lot of people did see it my way uh, quite. So it is like the EU like a friend of ours or not? Is that okay? First of all, my wife didn't have a field day. My family believed, even though I was born here, I've developed an accent when I speak. I can't hear it, but I've seen it sometimes in the YouTube comments as well. So she's going to hear your comments. She's going to say, get, they thought you were born abroad. But the, 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 the point that I will say is this, when it comes to the focus on Hamas, Israel had two tactics in order to try to push back against the narrative. The first was to insist this was a Hamas offensive, rather than the, and ignore the other nine, ten different factions that also participated in this offensive. The reason they did so is to put every wall of us here with our hands behind our back and, and cuffed. So that if you focus on Hamas, you guys are supporting terrorism or like. But the reality is that it's not a Hamas offensive. And I'll tell you why. When you look at Hussein Zomlot, he's not Hamas. He's the main face that is defending this Palestinian offensive. Mustafa Barghouti is from the West Bank. He's not Hamas. Hamas have a lot of problems with him as well. He's the guy who went with Farid Zakaria. Mohammed Al-Kurd is not Hamas. He's from Jerusalem. He's the guy who covers. So it shows you that it's not a Hamas thing. It's a Palestine thing. 
And the reason they're focusing on Hamas is to stifle the discussion about what's actually happening. And that's why I always say to my Muslim brothers, don't get caught with the bait. It's not Hamas. It's not about Hamas. It's about the Palestinians from the river to the sea. They're the ones who are pushing back. And all, everything suggests that's actually what's happening. The second thing they tried to do was to assert that Iran was involved. The reason they wanted to say Iran was involved was because it was easier for Netanyahu to say that there's international support, that is a villain, as opposed to the Palestinians actually doing this. I think that when it comes to British Muslims here and the EU, I think one thing that is worth noting, Ibn Taymiyyah said that Allah will preserve an un-Islamic state that is just and destroy a Muslim state that is unjust. The reason why the EU had its perks for Muslims and still has its perks for Muslims is that there is recourse to law via the courts when there is a violation or a transgression. Suela Brahman has been trying to ship people off to Rwanda for how long? The reason she can't do it is because a judge says that she can't do it. In Saudi Arabia, the judge can say anything he wants, and then bin Salman says something, and the judge says, well, I asked if someone, Amir, I made a mistake. As you wish it. There is actually a funny story, I'll just tell you quickly. It's not a long story. The head of the PIF, the Public Investment Fund for Saudi Arabia, so when they wanted to buy Newcastle United, they had to prove that the government is not involved in it. So there was an interview that the head of the PIF did with, with the Arabic channel. So the presenter says, as part of this mock-up uh, orchestrated play, so the, he's the chairman, but he doesn't have a direct role. Yes, he's the chairman, but he doesn't have a direct role. So when you were the crown prince, you're head of the board, and he's the chairman. When you have a disagreement about an investment, has that ever happened before? He said, yes, of course it's happened. He said, how is it resolved? He said, we have processes in place. He said, what's the process? He says, give me an example. He said, we had an incident where all of the board of directors were agreed on the crown prince wanted to invest in something, and the board of directors were all against. So he said, how is it resolved? He said, well, we have processes. We take it to the prime minister's office. It's a man's the prime minister. <laughs> he said this with a straight face. It's his own line as well. And then after that, it goes to the king's office. The king, of course, was out of action, suffering from Alzheimer's and skin, and ruled by his side. And then the king gives a decision, and he sorts out between us. And the presenter says, okay, so in that case, in whose favor was it decided? He said, the crown prince. I think that sometimes, one of the things that is worth noting, and I actually had an elder, uh, elder brother once, when I was 50 or 60, put me in my place, when I said to him, you know, Darwell, how about at this kind? And he said to me, look, Sam, first of all, we're persecuted in our own countries, number one. You try and go and do half of the da'wah that you do here, you'll be like, well, the other Mashay in Saudi Arabia, now we're in prison, there's not even a peak. The second point is, they're upset because of the proliferation of message. Because more and more people are entering Muslim. How many of you have heard of Paul Williams? Paul Williams is an Englishman who converted to Islam, and he's just been ranked as one of the top 500 most influential Muslims. If you look at Sheikh Abdul Hakim al Murad, some people are calling him now the Sheikh in Islam of the United Kingdom. But do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entered Islam into his hearts? And that's why I think that sometimes it's true that we have a negative view on Europe in terms of stance that they take on Israel or the like. But why do you think Macron is imposing a lot of these laws in the crackdown for Islam? It's because there's a new French generation that is growing up where their heroes are not blue-eyed, blonde-haired French. They are Paul Pogba, they are Zinedine Zidane, they are Karim Benzema, Kylian Mbappe. They are all these non-French figures. You ask a French kid today with blonde hair and blue eyes, what do you want to be when you're older? I want to be Kenan Mbappe. Okay. I want to be Zinedine Zidane. Who's ever, you know, the comedian Dave Chappelle? He became Muslim at a pizza hut, at a pizza store. He said, I just love the Muslims the way they operate. So I decided to become Muslim. It's not about whether he, he practices like a strong Muslim. In his heart, Islam entered his heart because he saw the Muslims all the like. Now read the numbers about people entering Christianity or Judaism and all the like. They don't compare to the people entering Islam. And that's what I meant earlier in terms of the Muslim <coughs> Ummah sees itself in decline. Whereas the non-Muslims see the Muslim Ummah in the ascendancy, and therefore there's a necessity to impose these laws to restrict it. When Suella Brahman says, I want to ban the raising of the Palestinian flag, that's never happened before. The reason she's doing it is because there is such a major display of sympathy with Palestinians that they're shocked that there's such a large number of Muslims in the United Kingdom that is unprecedented, and now they're thinking, oh my goodness, these Muslims are growing. How do we deal with that phenomenon? And that's why I think that sometimes we look at it with an antagonistic perspective. But I always argue sometimes, and, and, and another advice my father gave me was, was to read the book of Sirah as a political book. I like the exchange of Musa ibn Umayy with Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. 
I like that exchange where Sa'ad brings his spear, telling him, if you don't convince me, I'll kill you. And Musa ibn Umayy says, Allah, I hear what I have to say. If you don't like it, you don't, just hear me out first. I like that Musa ibn Umayy keeps his cool and calm and dignity and authority in the face of somebody like, uh, I don't know, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, mashallah, was, but in, in Kufr, he might have been described as Nigel Farage or somebody. The point here being is that, is the point here being is that sometimes I think that we always see ourselves within the lens of those who oppose us without remembering Allah has given us a unique lens through which to judge ourselves. And that's why I think that sometimes what I find quite fascinating is that when the Prophet Muhammad entered Mecca, he didn't judge between them based on how they would have judged. He judged based on the principles of Islam. When Umar ibn Khattab entered Al-Quds anhu, he didn't judge based on Jewish law, Christian law, how they might have treated. He judged them based on how Muslims did. And the reason why I say that is that when you change your perspective to what Islam demands from you, when you see animosity, you see the potential for victory. When you see tension, you think, okay, Umar ibn Khattab went to beat up his sister over Quran. Something is clicking in the back of my head. There is a potential, there's a possibility there. Let me see what I can do. I'm not saying this in an airy fairy way. I'm saying this that as Muslims ourselves, the reason why we get the most backlash is because we're a growing force. The reason why we get the most backlash is because we're increasing in number. The reason why we get the most backlash is not because we're weak, but because we're getting stronger. And unfortunately, I think sometimes the Ummah doesn't appreciate that strength. But I promise you to what a brother does. And the other journalists, GB News, they do. They see a strength that you don't see in yourselves. And that's what I meant by counting the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because life is well lived when you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that you see and everything that you read. Butter. <laughs> Not sure who to take. I saw you earlier with your hand up, so I'm going to go to you in the center. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. That are attributing the current problem that the Ummah of is facing to the fact that the Muslims are divided into nation states and the rulers of these nation states only pursue the interests of their own nations and they're not, they don't bring in the Ummatic paradigm in how to view things. And so they're saying that the ultimate solution is to dismantle the nation state model in the Muslim world and have a united polity. Where is this on that? So just to summarize the question for those that could not hear, uh, the brother was asking about the problematic system of nation states and the fact that each nation only looks out for themselves because that's the nature of what a nation state is as opposed to a more automatic model. Uh, how do you see the situation in, in relation to that? I think that in abstract, the idea of no nation states is a wonderful concept of a united Ummah. I think in the course of history, however, it undermines and underplays the noble sacrifices of those who fought the colonial powers. I'll explain what I mean. Algeria as a state didn't emerge because the Algerians identified the state called Algeria. It emerged because that was the territory France controlled and they turfed the French and they weren't interested in opening up a new front with the Italians in Libya. The Italians, when they took Libya from the Ottoman Empire, they carved out an, a set of territory that was called Trop Tropicana and then later on became Libya. When the Moroccans, for example, they had a kingdom of life, they had some borders they could identify with, but they fought where the French and the Spanish were and didn't go beyond that. By that, what I mean is, is that I don't think that they ever envisaged an ummah of nation states, but saw the nation states as a transition towards restoring something that resembles an ummah, and then self-interest got involved that has hampered that part. By that, what I mean is this. Imagine that your whole life, your father's persecuted, your grandfather's tortured, your mother is killed, your sisters are... You go to the mountains and you fight, you're in the trenches. It's a brutal war for liberation. Many people die. In Algeria, one million and a half die, and finally the French are leaving a certain set of territory, and you say, Alhamdulillah, they're gone. Your immediate intention is not let me go start another war. Your immediate intention is let's preserve and entrench what we've gained. Let's recover. Let's try to build something here that can be a haven and an outpost. 
before we consider how we can expand to the next stage, which is the Ummah and the Light. And that's where I think sometimes there was a disconnect in the debate. In that when the part diverged, because when Algeria found independence and Tunisia and Libya, in 1974, for 24 hours, Tunisia and Libya joined as one nation. Because they argued it should be one Ummah. Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, I think it was for a year or six months, my history is messed up. They became one state. Because they argued that really the end game was never nation state. The end game was Ummah. And they tried it, and of course, as a result of events and political events that happened from Europe, from the US, and even domestically and the like, it ended up breaking apart. But the reason I use these examples is to show you that the intention of even those who established the nation states, they saw it as a stopgap through which to then expand and join with other nations to try to reconnect this Ummah with each other. And I think that as a, and the, the reason that they haven't been able to, even though in the grand scheme of history, it's only really been 80 years. I know sometimes we're arrogant to think that believe history is only important when we live in it. But history is, is a long tapestry and we're only a minuscule detail in that. But the point here being is that I think that the focus on the nation states as if it's an aberration, neglects why the nation states emerged in the first place. And I've met Mujahideen. And I've sat with them, and I've never met a Mujahid who dreamed of a nation state. Every Mujahid I met, I, I met always talked about it as a vehicle through which to go to something noble, which is the Ummah. And all of them expressed deep disappointment that the poli that policies and the politics that came afterwards was something so averse to something that is Ummati. When you go to Algeria, when you look at the countries of independence now, so many are trying to leave. Algeria now has a law where if they sense you're Algerian and you don't have nationality, they try to impose it on you. They don't give you visa for the British passport because they're aware that Algerians are leaving because they no longer have faith in what the country has become, even though it has the blood of one million and a half martyrs, which shows that they're upset about something, which is they're upset about how the nation state has emerged. And this is where I think there's a disconnect in the debate and where both sides haven't appreciated each other in the debate. One sees the other as an evil scourge that emerged and undermines the nobility of the people who achieve that consequence and outcome. And the other side see the other as idealistic people who don't understand the practicalities because they were never in the mountains and trenches fighting an overwhelming force that is superior in every single way in technology. And they don't appreciate the value of what liberation was. And the final point I will say, you say is this. Algeria, when it got its independence, it didn't say, congratulations, Algerian people, we have an Algerian state. They said, Ya Muhammad, Mabruk Aliq and Jazahir Rajak Aliq. Ya Muhammad, congratulations, O Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Congratulations, Algeria has returned to you. Algeria has returned to the Ummah. This land, this primary identity is not Algeria, it belongs to the Ummah. And I think in the 70s and 80s, when the tensions between Morocco, Algeria, competition between Abd al Nasser and Bourguiban, and Huwari, Boumedian and the like, when it all catalyzed and Russia began supporting one side, the Saudis invited the Americans to push back against the British and the others, and, the, and everybody started playing the superpowers of one another. I think practicalities meant that it became a very difficult thing. But having said that, if you look at the past 80 years, official colonization, then independence movements, or be economic dependency, then Arab Spring, people lashing out, toppling authoritarian regimes, now you have the Palestinians lashing out 70 years after their land had been taken. They finally managed to take land back from the Israelis. I think that in the tapestry of history, certainly we're in an upward trajectory, even if we don't like the journey or the course that has been taken during this journey. And Allah alam and he knows this. I'm going to finish with one last question. There was someone, sorry, brother, sorry. There was someone to the left that was calling out, and it was over there. Yes, uh, I'm sorry for everyone because... Time is limited, um, so I hand over. It's my fault, I'm so sorry. I still have to salam. I still have to but it's too bad without that. Thank you. For uh, well, the last three minutes of your talk um, was the most powerful part of your talk. Um, we, if we can get this recording, all of we can then cut it, or you can cut it and do something first, and we can pass it. And inshallah, within a week, at one million, your hand will be 10. <laughs> no, I'm saying it's all serious, but we need, you recorded it, whoever did, Allah bless you, all of us need a copy of them. So how can we get a copy? That's what I want. Uh, someone is recording, I'm not entirely sure who, uh, 
But we uh, end up does anyone? That's right. I can see it's been recorded, so inshallah, whoever it is, I'm sure they'll make it aware to the community, inshallah. No. When? I honestly don't know, I'm not. When? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I've just been informed that it will be actually on the Muslim World Telegram channel. So you can just join now by searching for the Muslim World, inshallah, and you will see that it will be uploaded soon, inshallah. And inshallah, the Friday Circle channel as well. And we'll on try to get YouTube yes. and Instagram and other places, if you type uh, the Muslim World, you will find it, inshallah, if you type the Muslim the Friday World. Circle and the Friday Circle channel as well, just like, come on, little hey. Okay, because that wasn't really a question, I'll, I'll extend to one more question, and I'm sorry for all of those that I can't answer, there are so many people, so forgive me for those that I haven't picked, but I'm gonna pick this individual here, this brother here. That one, if you want to that's all that. I'm gonna ask you a question, to which it is. It might be very controversial for you. Raise your voice, brother. Okay, I'm gonna ask him, brother, a question. He wants to dig me a hole. That may be very controversial, because everything he said so far, negates this question in X, if it's not true. Okay. So our understanding of what happened over the weekend was that some Hamas militants attacked Israel and killed X amount of people. And now the Israelis are taking revenge for an attack that happened on occupied land. Okay. But my understanding of who the Israelis are and the capabilities they have and the intelligence they have and the infrastructure they have, yeah, I doubt very much that these guys were able to go in through the Israeli border without them not knowing. I'm telling you for a fact, a mosquito cannot even land on that wall without them knowing. They've got drones 24-7. They've got satellites 24-7. They've got, yeah, they've got the best military might that we all know about. And the fact that they were able to go in that amount of people, in that amount of weapons, with bulldozers and tanks, apparently, yeah, doesn't add up. Because even when they were in, it was a border question. Yeah, there were no soldiers. So the Israelis planned it? I'm not asking if the Israelis planned it, but someone must have known yes. about So to summarize for those that couldn't hear him, the sisters downstairs, uh, this is a suggestion that it surely would have been impossible for Hamas and the other resistance fighters to actually have entered into Israel without them not seeing it was a sophisticated surveillance because of all their technologies. Surely it's impossible. Surely then that means that perhaps they knew and allowed it to happen or something else, who knows? To put it very shortly, the first thing is that the only one who has an all-seeing eye is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second point worth noting is, I've worked in this industry now for about 15 years. I advise a number of governments, including the State Department of the US. One thing that you realize when you work with these people is, they don't know at all. There's a lot of confusion in these, not really, they don't. They, there's a lot of confusion they, when they react. If I can tell you, for example, when, when they call me on the phone to say, Sammy, Something has happened in Iraq, explain to us the Iranians, are they going to fire missiles or like? And sometimes it will be a deputy minister or the like. They don't know it. They are saying, you haven't tweeted yet, we haven't seen a video yet. Can you please tell us what's happening, what's breaking down? The stunning thing for me was, how can you, who is, you know, ministry of one of the top states, not have the information about what has unfolded before you or the like? The second point, that is, the third point that is worth noting is, I think that it's very plausible. In 1973, the reason, 1973, the reason Golda Meir had to resign was because the Israelis had far superior technology to the Egyptians and the Syrians. And it had the firm American support. But the Egyptians still managed to break through the Israeli line at Sinai, where the Israelis were monitoring because they believed it to be an easy place to monitor in comparison to everywhere else. She resigned after the end of the war because they accused her of the intelligence failures and intelligence holes. I think that the reality is that in our, and this is not about you specifically, I'm speaking just generally. I think that given our Muslims are used to the trauma of defeatism, we panic when hope emerges. I think given that Muslims are used to being beaten and battered, when we see hope or somebody stands up and says, I can make a change, we say all politicians are the same. For example, some brothers sometimes, and I'll say something controversial for the South Asians, because I know Imran Khan is a hot topic. 
Some Pakistanis will say, Sammy, you talk too much about Imran Khan, the economy wasn't improving under him. I tell him he wasn't. He wasn't toppled because of the economy. Okay, but his politics, he wasn't toppled because of his politics. He was toppled because he managed to mobilize enough Pakistanis that the establishment believed that he was threatening their grip on public opinion that enabled them to stay in power for however many years. That's why he got toppled. He stood up and said, Pakistan could be an influence. And they said, whoa, 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 sit down, sit down. We are the influence, not you. When Imran Khan, and I said, guys, he's in prison because they don't want him to run in elections, the reaction of some of my Pakistani friends was, all politicians are the same. The hope Imran Khan inspired with the Kuala Lumpur summit, when all of us, and I remember 2019, I remember watching it thinking, SubhanAllah, Allah, if they pull this off, they will drag the center of power from Saudi Arabia and the Arabs to the South Asians. When that hope emerged, when I saw that these leaders were able to emerge hope, it's not that they're going to cause groundbreaking change, but I feel like we Muslims, when somebody comes and says, Yeah, Ibadullah, we can do it. <laughs> well, we Muslims say, Oh, the, 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 there's a victory coming. What victory will I? You know what? I predict that the Americans are going to come in and they're going to do this. And, and you don't appreciate that victory. At the time in which they need you to elevate, you're telling them it's a, that, that no, 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 there, there must have been some. And that's why I think that sometimes politics is the science of human relations. And I think that everybody's in a fog of war. I don't think everybody knows it all. And I think that the Arab Spring, and I'm originally from Tunisia, my, my, my father's from Tunisia, my mother's Algerian, and I'm from Sidi Bouzid, where the Arab Spring began. And I know the Bouazizi family. I know, I know, you know, Mohammed Bouazizi who burned himself to set up the trend. And I know what Sidi Bouzid is like, and I can confess to you, it, it's a rusty, dusty city. I'm from the village where we have all the olive trees and the like, it's beautiful, it's so scenic. But Sidi Bouzid, the city itself, is a dusty city. If I told you and I took you, invited you to Sidi Bouzid, and I said, you know what, from here, brothers, we're going to change the whole region. Wallahi he'd laugh. You would tell me, Wallah, it's Jahid. Sidi Bouzid, you can see from the entrance to the exit. From the entrance, you can see the end, the end of the city. But here is where the sharara, the fire started, that bin Ali was toppled. I'll tell you something also. You know when bin Ali fled on the Friday? The, well, it's easy, he burnt himself on the Monday. On the Tuesday, they sacked the interior minister. On the Wednesday, people were protesting. And everybody started protesting the city. On the Friday, when he fled, not a single Tunisian believed he would flee. We were talking about a coalition government in which the opposition, and we have like a fake election, where the opposition would get some seats in agreement. When he fled, all the Tunisians went, oh, Allah, did he actually go? And there was a, there was a, a viral scene of a man in, 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 in his apartment of going, Bin Ali, rah, Bin Ali, harab, Bin Ali has run away. Bin Ali, he can't believe it. He's telling him, guys, believe it, he's run, he's gone. It's end, the zulumat is finished. I think that hope, and I know it sounds airy fair. I think that when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, went to the Sahaba, he instilled with them that hope when everything suggested they would be annihilated. And that's why when it went to the Battle of Badr, there were one of when they stayed behind. They told him, you guys are going out and they've they all gathered against you. You should fear them. You know, the Prophet the Prophet gave them enough hope that when they thought they would be exterminated, they pulled off the greatest victories. The reason the Prophet is a miracle is because he achieved things he should not have been able to achieve objectively. The reason he's a miracle is because he pulled off things that he should never have been able to achieve. And the reason why, and one of the things that I argue is very important for political analysis, is you need to include Allah in the factor. That Allah can cause explosions to come. If you had told me last week that this explosion was coming, I don't think that anybody would have predicted it. In fact, I think that Biden and Netanyahu, they were ready for normalization of ties with Israel. Biden was going to take it as his foreign policy masterpiece for his elections. Biden did not want this to happen. Netanyahu was about to sign what he called the deal of the century, the greatest deal since the Cold War. Netanyahu did not need this escalation. The Saudis, Bin Salman, according to Reuters, was telling him, I'm giving up the Palestinian cause. I don't care. And he was going to the Jordanians and telling them, Maybe kick one here. And, and, they were, and Bin Salman was going to the Jordanians and telling them, King of Jordan, I want to be custodian of Al-Aqsa as well. And information, I won't say who said it, but part of my job is to sit privately with diplomatic delegations when they're involved in negotiations regarding the region. I was sitting with a European delegation and they had invited me to talk about the lay of the land and, and, and what's going on. And, and it's good opportunity sometimes to push your agenda sometimes when you talk to them. And the question they asked was, this is after the Thinking Muslim podcast about the Israelis in Riyadh. So they said to me, we watched the Thinking Muslim podcast, foreign ministry of one of the major European states, and they said, we were surprised that you said that the, that the Saudis are ready to abandon Palestine. I said, well, why would you be surprised by it? They said, because that's what the Saudis are telling us. And Sami, I'll tell you something. 
This is one of the diplomats saying. I want to say this so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> the Israelis, when we talk to them, they say something very strange. What is it that they say? Sami, they're convinced that bin Salman will hand over the land around Al-Aqsa to Israel. And that's why bin Salman is demanding that Al-Aqsa be transferred from the custodianship of King Jordan to bin Salman. So he will become the custodian of three holy mosques and then hand over. And the reason why I think that's plausible is because Hamad bin Jassim, the former Qatari prime minister, in, in, in a series of Twitter threads after he left power, he said that during his time, there was a state that normalized, everybody knew he stood by UAE, the Palestinians refused to sell their land to the Israelis. So what the UAE would do is they would send Arabs to the Palestinians and say, let me buy your land, and then go and sell it to the Israelis as part of a normalization <coughs> process, because the UAE wants to look beyond it, wants to be with India. You remember when Modi was persecuting the Muslims, it was the UAE that said, ta'ala, ta'ala, come. I'm considered a Muslim country, I'll help bail you out after your official insult of the Prophet Muhammad So the, the point here is this. I, understand, I, I think that it's logical for people to come to that conclusion. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not blowing you out of the water and saying it's ridiculous at all. But what I do want to say is, Wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu, they don't know it all. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu, they don't have an all-seeing eye. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha illahu, what they fear the most is a sleeping dragon, a sleeping power that exists and they're desperate to ensure that power doesn't explode. That admission in and of itself means they believe there's a power that exists that is superior to their power. And that implies that they don't have all the capabilities, which is why they have to crush the movement in Egypt by, bringing, by helping Sisi to power, why they had to crush the movement in Libya with NATO intervention, why they had to crush and bring their coup in Tunisia, why they had to crush all these movements, because what they're terrified of more than anything it's not that a leader will come who will change everything. They're worried about that the people will stand behind the leader and upend all the dynamics. The reason why I'm following Pakistan, and I'll finish on this point, the reason why I'm following Pakistan, and why I like Imran Khan, I like Imran Khan, not because I know anything about his policies, but because I love the challenge that he's done to this time. It's unprecedented. I've never seen an establishment be so clumsy. 200 plus charges and they still can't indict them on a single charge. They have to send paramilitaries to arrest him. They have to kidnap Osman Dar for 20 days and haul him in front of the TV to give a confession that everybody can see is forced. They have to take down Imran uh, Riaz uh, Khan and to make him disappear for six months. Miskin, he comes out with his uh, beard all white and his hair all white and he can't speak anymore. They have to crush, they're doing it so public as in they can't even hide it. And the reason they can't hide it or they can't be sophisticated about it is because the challenge from the people that we think are weak is so grave and so threatening that there's a desperate attempt to politically engineer in broad daylight and a hope that the people will go home and stop manifesting that power so that they can prevent Imran Khan and Pitai from running in the elections. My point is, it's not about whether Imran Khan is good or not, it's that Imran Khan has mounted a challenge that I believe will be in the benefit of the Ummah. And that's why I think sometimes when I see Muslims, they say, yeah, but I don't like the way people praise him. Yeah, that's not the point. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, People are determined by whether they stand with what is right. You don't determine what is right by who's standing on it. Imran Khan is maloom. What does it have to do what you think of him? You should be backing him. Because the consequence that he will bring is in our favor. And that's why I think that sometimes when you look at Sahaba, they didn't always agree with each other. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq did the Hurub al-Ridda, when he went after the people who didn't pay zakat, Ali ibn Abi Talib initially did not go with them because he was upset that they had decided the Khilafah without him. He'd been at the funeral, and so he went to his house and hadn't given bayah. When he saw that Abu Bakr was fighting those who wouldn't pay zakat, he records and he says that I realized that Islam had come under threat, and so I woke up from my slumber, I got up, I gave my bay'ah to Abu Bakr, and I went and fought for what is right. That until the deen became victorious, the mood was relaxed. Ali ibn Abi Talib set aside his grievance with Abu Bakr and Umar al-Khattar al and he went and he fought. And that's what the ummah should be like. And when you, if you want an answer why the ummah is weak, it's because we don't do that. Because instead of focusing on the cause, we say, Wallahi, but he's getting all the credit, there's no point for it. Wallahi, in the, we, we, we're like the people in the Quran, idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila. Go you and your Lord and find inna hauna qa'idun. We are here sitting down. Let's see first what you do and then ask, instead of going, Wallahi, you know what? There's a haq here. And Allah says, وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا Do not let a hatred of a people, their hatred for you or your hatred for them, prevent you from doing what is just. You may not like people, but you should be able to identify the haq even when it's in the favor of somebody you don't like. 
And that's when the Ummah will restore the power that you're looking for. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. For a truly insightful evening, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you profusely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you success in this world and in the next. Jazakallah khair for everyone joining us this evening for a very extended session. Jazakallah khair. Please give generously on your way out to the cause. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.